Welcome. I'm Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory and welcome to our webinar measuring air handler flow accurately. And we're going to demonstrate two different pieces of equipment from the Energy Conservatory for measuring air handler flow accurately. The first one is a true flow air handler flow meter. And the second one is using the duct blaster fan using the pressure matching method to measure air handler flow. If you're having trouble with your audio, go to the meetings pull down menu and choose the audio setup wizard and that will step you through how to get your uh, audio up and running. And please type in questions as you think of them in the um, the uh, question and answer session at the right section on the right. And we will be answering, uh, typing in answers to questions as we go through the webinar and then we'll be covering, we'll take some time and, and review those questions and take additional questions at the end. There will be a link to our webinar on our website. Um, we usually get that up within a couple of days. So if you want to view it again or share it with others, you can uh, feel free to do that. In our agenda today, um, first we'll cover why measuring air handler flow is important and um, some of the advantages to using the true flow air handler flow meter other, over other measures. Um, we'll cover the true flow system components, what's included with the true flow system and what type of gauges um, you're able to use with the true flow, what type of pressure gauges uh, other than the DG700. And um, we'll cover the basic true flow test procedures. Um, and, and we'll also cover a procedure using uh, or taking measurements on a system that has two returns. Certain parts of the country that seems to be pretty common these days. And we'll talk about options for measuring those type of systems. And then we'll cover the duct blaster um, pressure, pressure matching method also. So why is measuring airflow important? Um, insufficient airflow is, is certainly a common, um, common problem that we see. And low airflow can, can lead to decreased um, capacity, certainly decreased capacity if you're not getting the proper airflow. You could even be freezing up a, a coil if not enough air is moving across it. Um, you'll, you'll see increased energy usage and certainly comfort problems if, if the um, air conditioning or heat isn't being uh, distributed uh, to where it's supposed to be properly. And also being able to, have, to, to accurately measure airflow uh, will allow you to, to optimize performance of your heat pump and air conditioner. You need, to, you need to know what the airflow is. You need to set the airflow accurately before um, before you set the charge on the system. So when you're when you're setting up a new system, you need to know accurately know what the airflow is. So some advantages to using the true flow is um, some of the widely used uh, methods are, are problematic or, or time consuming. Um, you want a method that's simple or accurate. You know certainly having a, a quick easy way, um, to, to give you the accurate results you're looking for is, is, uh, is very helpful. And it's proven success over, over years of field testing. It came out in 2001 and it's widely used throughout the HVAC and home performance industries. Um, it can be used with uh, any manometer with a resolution of one Pascal. Um, those of you that are using inches of water, it's, uh, 0.005 inches of water. Um, the DG700 has a resolution of a tenth of a Pascal, but you can use a pressure gauge with a resolution of, of at least a Pascal. Um, flow accuracies, um, plus or minus 7% when you're using a gauge that has a 1% accuracy. Um, or if you're using the uh, magnahelic gauge, you'll have about uh, uh, plus or minus 9% accuracy. The flow range, um, the number 14 true flow plate, which is uh, um, the size of it's uh, 14 by 20. You can measure airflow 365 to 1565 CFM. 
and the larger plate, the 20 by 20, the number 20 true flow plate, uh, 485 to 2100 CFM. Uh, system weight is uh, going to be about 13 pounds for the total system. Um, so the, the components include the carrying case, pictured at the right, uh, everything neatly uh, fits into that carrying case and it folds in half and zips up and uh, has a carrying handle uh, to move it around. Uh, it includes uh, some laminated flow conversion tables if you're not using the um, uh, pressure and flow gauge. It has a 10 foot blue and a 30 foot clear tubing uh, and an operations manual along with the two calibrated plates, the um, 14 by 20, the number 14, and the 20 by 20, number 20 uh, true flow plates. Comes with both of those. Along with eight um, spacers for sizing adjustments on it. So it will include the, the most common, it'll fit the most common um, filter sizes. Also includes a static pressure probe that's got a magnetic connection uh, to attach to the side of a plenum. And gauge options, again, gauge resolution of, uh, of one Pascal or 0 0.005 inches of water, uh, which would be a DG700, DG500, DG3, or DG2. Um, other digital manometers, there's a lot of other manometers out there that would meet this uh, resolution of one Pascal um, requirement uh, or magnahelic gauge. So the basic uh, procedures, you want to, to get the most accurate reading, you want to be at the location closest to the air handler. So if there's a filter grill um, right at the air handler, that's a preferred location to um, say a return filter grill, if you have the option of the two. The basic test procedure um, with the air handler on and the filter in place will measure the normal system operating pressure and you'll see that abbreviation NSOP a lot throughout this presentation. That's the normal system operating pressure. And um, we'll replace the filter with the true flow. And then we'll measure the true flow system operating pressure, which is likely to be different than the normal system operating pressure. The filter may be more restrictive or the true flow may be more restrictive, but they're likely to be a different number. You know, if the pressure is the same, the flow is the same. So we need to make an adjustment um, then we'll measure the airflow next is the next step and then calculate the flow resistance correction factor. Um, we can use either a chart or a formula um, to come up with that correction factor and then we'll use that correction factor to calculate the adjusted flow. So our setup first if we've got if we've got a dirty filter in there it's a good idea to, to uh, replace it with a clean one to, before taking the our normal system operating pressure we we'll want to make sure all the registers are open so we'll get the maximum flow through the system. We we'll want to open a window. Um, if when we turn on the air handler it changes the pressure in the room, that's a problem because we're, we're reading the, the operating system pressure <clears throat> with respect to the room we're in. And if the pressure in the room changes, then, our, then, our, uh, then we're getting the wrong number. So we want to open a window um, to the outside. If, if our air handler is in a crawl space or an attic or a garage, we'll want to open uh, that space to the outdoors. So um, turning on the air handler won't affect that pressure. Then we'll insert our static pressure probe and we'll want that probe to be pointing into the airflow. Um, we can install it on the side of a supply plenum. And by the side, I mean if you're facing a um, an upright air handler and there's a, a trunk coming towards you and a trunk going away from you, you want to install the uh, static pressure probe on the side of the plenum, on either the left side or right side of the plenum, the sides that don't have the trunk lines coming off of them. You could put it in the dead end corner of a supply plenum. That's going to be a location also that's going to have a, um, a pretty stable static. Um, and a dead end corner is defined as uh, <clears throat> a corner that doesn't have duct or a trunk line or a register within eight inches. So um, if none of those three things, a duct, a trunk, or a register are within eight inches, then we'll have a pretty stable pressure there. Um, 
We could put it on the side of a return plenum if that return plenum doesn't have a trunk line, a return register, or a return duct connected to it. Um, we want that static pressure probe to be at least 24 inches from the true flow plate, 24 inches from a 90 degree corner, and 24 inches from a return any return trunk line connections. And also, if we're installing our true flow plate at a remote filter location, then we don't want the probe, the static pressure probe, going in the return plenum. Next, we'll enter the normal system operating pressure um, if we're using a DG700. Um, and, and using a DG700 simplifies this, this uh, process. Um, because instead of recording the normal system operating pressure and the true flow system operating pressure and using a charter formula to determine the flow resistance correction factor, it's all done internally. So you can simply enter the normal system operating pressure into the DG700, um, similar to entering a, a, a baseline into the DG700. So those of you who do uh, blower dart tests are familiar with that baseline function of the gauge. Um, so you'll enter in that normal system operating pressure, and then the DG700 will automatically adjust the flow or the difference between the normal system operating pressure and the true flow system operating pressure. So it really uh, makes that whole process uh, much simpler. So we'll connect the tubing from the, from the probe to the gauge. We will turn on the air handler, um, set the DG700 to the pressure air handler mode. So we'll click the um, click our mode button on the DG700 and we'll, we'll push it, uh, kept, uh, keep pressing it until we toggle across um, pressure flow, pressure flow at 25, pressure flow at 50, etc. until we get to PR, the PRAH mode. When we get to the PRAH mode, we're going to see NSOP flashing. Um, once that begins flashing, um, we will push the start button. So um, start button is in the, the middle here. Uh, once we push start, we'll see the seconds start to count off. So th these are our seconds and it'll count up one, two, three, four, five. And once the, the pressure on the left becomes stable, this is going to be a it's going to display a long term averaging. So over time it'll get more and more stable. And once it stays the same for three or four seconds, we can push enter. And then that enters the normal system operating pressure into the gauge. Next, we'll install the true flow plate. And um, as you can see, you can install that at a, um, at a remote filter grill. If you've got a filter grill right at the air handler, um, either horizontal or vertical, you can install it there. And if you, if you have a um, one like is pictured at the right here where you have a return drop, um, you want to make sure that the spacers are on the top because as air is coming down that drop, there's going to be a lot of airflow at the bottom. And if you have that spacer at the bottom, you'll miss that. Um, you'll miss that, um, some of that. You'll, you'll be adding resistance to that airflow where it, uh, it really doesn't need to be. Um, so you remove the existing filter, choose the appropriate um, true flow plate. You'll add the spacers uh, top and side as needed. And um, you want to um, face the front into the airflow. And the front is defined as the side that has the two uh, uh, diamond-shaped energy conservatory stickers on it. You want that to point into the airflow. Um, it's important that all the airflow must pass through the plates and not around the plates. Um, and all the air must also pass over the plate. So if you have a, a 14 by 14 um, register that you want to you wanna put the true flow plate over and the true flow plate is, is 14 by 20, all of those holes aren't, don't have air passing through them. It's measuring uh, total pressure and static pressure and averaging them over the array. And um, air must uh, pass over that entire plate, not just part of it.
Otherwise, it'll be averaging. <laughs> it'll be including aver uh, averages from locations where there's no hole, where there's um, um, where the holes aren't seeing any airflow. Um, you want no obstruction six inches upstream or two inches downstream. Uh, that can affect the accuracy. So. Um, the air handlers downstream, if that's less than two inches away, that, that, that could be problematic. Um, so six inches upstream, two inches downstream. Um, it can be installed right inside the air handler cabinet. Um, you can tape it in place or, or wedge it in place as long as no airflow is going around it and all the airflow is going through it. Um, you could install it inside the air handler cabinet as long as you have at least a two inch space between the true flow and the, the the uh, air handler fan itself. Next step, we'll measure the adjusted um, total flow. So we've installed the true flow plate. We've already taken the normal system operating pressure and entered it in the gauge. Um, we'll connect the two tubes from the true flow plate to channel B. Um, there are colored tubing on that, but, but uh, where you connect the tubing, you'll get the same measurement whether you put a tube on uh, input or reference. So you'll connect those two tubes, one to input, one to reference, the two tubes coming from the true flow plate. We'll change the device to, to TF for true flow. So we'll we'll push the device button on the DG700 gauge and we'll, we'll keep pushing that to toggle across the different devices till we get to true flow. And then we'll change our configuration to, to match the plate being used. The default will be 14, and if we're using the 20, we'll hit the config button and toggle to 20. Next, we'll turn on the air handler. If our numbers are fluctuating, um, so if our flow numbers, um, on this side uh, showing 1566, if, if those numbers are fluctuating, we'll click the time average button, and we'll toggle through from one to five to 10 to long. We'll, and we'll leave it at um, long-term average until our, our flow number is pretty stable. And once that stays the same for a few seconds, um, we can either push hold or we can, uh, we can write down that number. Either way, we'll need to write it down because the DG700 doesn't store numbers. So we'll record our adjusted flow reading. And, and the reading that's being displayed, you see it says ADJ here. Um, and that means it's making the adjustment for the difference between normal system operating pressure and true flow system operating pressure. It's automatically making those adjustments. You don't need to look on the charts or figure that, that adjustment factor. It's, it's doing it automatically. And the flow you're reading is the adjusted flow. Next, we'll talk about the true flow procedure using other pressure gauges. And um, it's basically the same as with using the DG700, except you'll need to convert the pressure reading you, you get at the true flow plate. So that's on, on channel B is where you'll have the true flow plate. So you'll be reading a, a pressure from the two, two, from the two tubings from the true flow. Um, and you use that to, uh, uh, on a chart to convert pressure to flow. And then you'll also need to adjust the flow based on the pressure difference between the normal system operating pressure and the true flow system operating pressure using a chart or a formula. So to use the charts, um, what I'm showing here is Appendix A of the true flow manual, and it has two different charts, one using Pascal's and one using inches of water. Um, so for example, with the, the Pascal chart, um, the plate pressure, the pressure we're measuring um, on the gauge um, will go across to whichever column uh, for using the 14 or we're using the 20, we'll move over to that column to see what the CFM is. So if we've got 68, we'll have uh, 948 with the um, number 14 plate and 1279 with the number 20 plate. So that's how we convert pressure uh, to flow using the charts. 
Um, next, we'll need to adjust uh, the flow based on the difference between the normal system operating pressure and true flow system operating pressure. So we'll record the normal system pressure. We'll record the true flow system pressure. Um, we we'll use a chart to determine the multiplier. Um, so this is the Pascal chart. So let's say to start with, our normal system operating pressure is 50 Pascals. We'll follow that down to what our um, true flow system operating pressure is in Pascal. So let's say it's 46. That uh, was our true flow. We'll follow that across to 50 with our normal system operating pressure, and we'll see we're at 1.04. So we'll multiply our airflow reading times 1.04 to get our adjusted flow. And the same with the, uh, this is the intro of a water chart. We'll do the same thing. Um, with normal system operating pressure and follow that down to uh, our true flow and at the intersection is our multiplier. So procedure um, using two returns. Um, if the returns share a trunk, we can, we can measure right at the air handler inside the cabinet if possible, or if there's a filter rack there, we can, uh, we can measure it at that location. Um, the, the true flow plate can be put at an angle in a um, in a filter grill or in a in a um, return drop or a, or or a filter grill. It can it can be put at an angle as long as uh, it's not two inches away from uh, from an obstruction um, downstream or six inches upstream. We can uh, we can put it in at an angle. Um, Sometimes uh, returns will enter a cabinet from, from different sides. And um, if, if the second return is smaller than, than 14 by 20, uh, you can use a, a transition. For example, if, if you commonly run across something like a, a second return that's a 14 by 14, you can fabricate a, a 14 by 14 to 14 by 20 transition and then put the uh, 14 by 20 plate at, at the end of that transition. And that way, um, all the airflow is, is uh, moving across that true flow and, um, and you can get a measurement on that second return that way. Um, if you're using the DG700, it's helpful to have a long tube for, for the channel A operating pressure. Um, that will reach both of the um, locations where you're taking measurements from. And, and that way you can use that, that, um, that function where you enter the normal system operating pressure into the system and, and, uh, and you can um, use one gauge and, uh, and take your, your flow reading separately and add them together. You'll have the adjusted flow from the first grill and the adjusted flow from the second grill and add those together. Um, next, we'll talk about a, a density correction. Um, there are charts that you can use to correct for density, both for temperature, uh, for airflow, uh, different temperatures of airflow moving through the plate, and also at different elevations. So, for example, if if um, you're measuring the flow with the air conditioning running, um, maybe you're at an extreme at 40 degrees, and and um, you'll see that you'll need to, at 40 degrees, you'll need to multiply it by 0.973 and um, to get your, your actual airflow number there. So it, it's about a 3% difference. So not a, not a huge difference, but, um, but it'll affect your, your uh, flow readings. And let's say we're at, um, at 70 degrees and, and 7,000 feet of elevation. Now we're up to about a 14% difference. So it's multiplied by 1.14 um, to get our actual uh, volumetric flow. And here's some volumetric flow um, recommendations. Um, if you're in a humid climate, um, humid air can take on uh, more energy than dry air, so you need less airflow. So between 350 and 400 CFM per ton. Uh, if you're in humid climates, if you're in dry climates, you're gonna need more airflow, somewhere between 400 and 425 per ton.
And if you're at 7,000 feet of elevation, you're going to need about 450 CFM per ton. And that's if you've made that adjustment for volumetric flow. Um, sometimes you'll be using, you'll be comparing with uh, standard CFM, SCFM, which is, is converting your flow to what it would be if you were at sea level and 68 degrees in sea level. So if, if that's the method you're using, then if you're at 7,000 feet and 70 degrees, you, you'll need to multiply your number by uh, 0.877 from the indicated flow. And indicated flow is the flow being read on the gauge. So the, the flow that's being read on the gauge, you'll need to multiply by 0.877 to get it back to sea level. Then you can use that 400 CFM per ton, for example. Um, next, we'll be talking about measuring total system airflow using the pressure matching method in the duct blaster fan. And the procedure, you'll want to measure, uh, first measure the normal system operating pressure. Um, you'll want to connect the duct blaster uh, fan to the duct system. And you want all the return airflow to be flowing through the duct blaster. So if you're attaching it right at the air handler, you're going to need to block off the return side. So all of the airflow, uh, all of the airflow that you're measuring needs to be going through the duct blaster fan. Um, and then we'll mat we'll turn on the duct blaster fan to match the normal system operating pressure, and then measure the flow through the duct blaster. Um, so like with the true flow, we will uh, first replace the dirty filters. We'll open all of the registers. We'll open a window. Um, because if the if the duct blaster um, or if the air handler fan uh, changes the uh, pressure in the room, we won't get an accurate reading because we're reading the operating pressure with reference to the room. If we change the room pressure uh, with the air handler running, we're not going to get an accurate reading. Um, we'll open the air handler zone to the outside. Um, if we're in a crawl space or we're in an attic or we're in a garage, we'll want to open that space to the outdoors. And um, so our setup again, um, we'll insert the static pressure probe pointing into the airflow. Um, we uh, we'll want to put that on a, we can, one of the options is to put it on the side of the supply plenum. and. Um, Side is defined as if you've got a, for example, an upright air handler and the supply trunk is coming towards you and another one going away from you, um, you want to insert it on either the left or right side of that supply plenum. So a side where the uh, plenum is not connected. You can put it in a dead end corner of a supply plenum. That's a good place to, to measure a stable static pressure. And the dead end corner is defined as a corner of the plenum that doesn't have a duct or a trunk or a register within eight inches of it. Um, you can put it at that location. Um, you can put it at the um, side of a return plenum without a trunk line return or register duct connected directly to it. Um, you want that static pressure probe to be at least 24 inches from the true flow plate, 24 inches from 90 degree corners, and 24 inches from a return trunk line connections. So we'll measure the normal system operating pressure, turn on the air handler, uh, turn on the gauge and, and write down the normal system operating pressure. Um, then the next step after we've recorded that normal system operating pressure with the filter in place, um, we will connect the duct blaster fan uh, to the system. And in the middle, um, picture where we see we're, we're connecting that fan right directly to the air handler cabinet using a we'll connect the, the fan to a piece of cardboard and then tape a piece of cardboard over that door opening. Um, if if there's restrictions uh, close to where the fan is there, we'll want to build it out like we're showing in that first the first image here. Um, but a lot of times uh, those air handler cabinets are getting more and more crowded over time where the, the fan is, is almost right against the door and, and there may be some uh, uh, electrical connections or a board or switches or something, uh, dip switches right right in the front there that are uh, creating a restriction too. So if we, if we build that out a bit, 
there'll be less restrictions uh, close to the fan and we'll get a lot more airflow through the fan. So that's um, that can be a time consuming part of, of using this method. But if you've already got this big, this piece of equipment, um, you'll get really accurate flows um, using it. Or you can connect it at a, um, at a remote uh, re, uh, return filter grill. So then after, uh, after we've, we've measured our, our uh, um, normal system operating pressure and attached our fan to the system, we'll want to match the normal system operating uh, pressure um, using the duct blaster fan. So we'll connect the tubing from the DG700 to the fan, the channel uh, B uh, input on the DG700, connect it to the tap on the duct blaster fan, and we'll set the DG700 to the pressure flow mode, pushing the mode button once. We'll turn on the air handler, and then we'll turn up the duct blaster fan to match the normal system operating pressure and then uh, record the to total system air handler flow. And if we have systems with um, um, with low flow, uh, if we've got a 10 and a half system, for example, we might have to put a flow ring on the duct blaster fan. We might, you might see that the normal system operating pressure is actually higher with the, uh, the duct blaster fan installed than it was before. And, and in that case, you'll have to add a you have to add ring one. Um, if you're if you're not able to to match the normal system operating pressure, so maybe you've got a five ton system, because the you're starting out before you turn the duct start turning the duct blaster fan on, you've already got the air handler running and it's drawing air through the fan. You'll actually get a, a flow reading on your DG seven hundred before you even uh, turn up the speed controller. So it's got a, a negative back pressure on it. So it's pulling air through the fan. And, and you, in, in some cases, you may be able to get up to 2000 CFM through that fan. So you may be able to match the normal system operating pressure. Um, so you turn the duct, if you're not able to measure, match the normal system operating pressure with the duct blaster fan turned all the way up, um, you want to record the CFM with the fan turned up all the way and uh, record the operating pressure you were able to achieve and then use the flow resistance correction factor from appendix b of the true flow manual to to correct that flow um, based on the operating pressure you are able to achieve so this is if if you have a duct blaster and not a true flow you can go on our website and download that um, that TrueFlow manual is a free download, so you can get at this uh, Appendix B um, for the flow resistance correction factors. And um, so let's say that your normal system operating pressure was 50, and you've got the duct blaster cranked all the way up, you're only able to get it to 40. You'll follow 40 across to 50 and find your, your uh, correction factor of 1.12 and you'll use that for uh, for your correction factor. Well, thanks for attending our webinar, um, measuring air handler flow accurately. Like we mentioned before, we will be putting this up on our, our website and on our YouTube site within a week or so. Um, if, if, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in on the right, and we'll go over some of those questions now. Well, thanks for um, attending our webinar today, and um, we will be um, doing webinars on a monthly basis for a while, and um, um, I'll take some time to, to go over the questions that have been asked already, and we'll take some time to answer any additional questions you might have. Um, so I'm going to start um, at the top. Um, Joseph asked a question about um, about testing a, a rooftop uh, unit where the air handler is up on the roof, and um, it, it, the important thing is to get the um, static pressure probe into a location where where we've got good stable pressure, and and that may be tricky in some of those instances depending on on uh, the accessibility of of the ductwork. It may require um, um, drilling a hole in a curb and and um, 
and installing a static pressure in the, in the corner of the plenum as best you can and then um, patching that hole to make it waterproof. Um, but, but this has been done um, often to do that. Sometimes those rooftop units will, will bring in outside air so it's taking some return from the outside and it's also taking some return air from the inside. <laughs> so you need to be careful on that. If, if you're only measuring the airflow at, say, uh, a return filter inside the building, um, then you're going to be missing the outdoor air, um, the, the uh, outdoor air that's being mixed with that. So, so you may need to um, um, check with the, the local maintenance people and, and see if they can block off that air that's coming from the outside for you um, or close the dampers if, if there are dampers on that or, or maybe you could in that case seal off that outdoor air and then, then you would be just measuring what the airflow would be if you were getting 100% indoor return air. Um, so we'll go down to the next question. Um, Mike asks, can this be done on, on manufactured homes? And uh, it can be done on ma manufactured homes. Um, it, it, part of it's depending on what the duct system looks like. Um, sometimes uh, a coil may be installed right on top of the unit and there's no, no ductwork at all. Um, to install the true flow in, and, and in a case like that, um, you wouldn't be able to accurately measure an airflow unless you somehow fabricated <laughs> a plenum out of cardboard and put the true flow on top or something like that. So there are there are instances where um, where you may, may need to use the duct blaster. It, it, it's more time consuming to set up, but um, but you could uh, um, attach a duct blaster in the air handler cabinet and and um, and maybe get some airflow measurements that way. Um, um, let's see. Um, and, and Jamie had some questions about, about um, there were a few questions that came up on if you've got a two return system. Um, if you have a true return system, it's important that all of the airflow be going through the true flow plates at the same time to get an accurate measurement. Um, and there are a number of ways you could do that. Um, one option is to um, right inside the air handler cabinet mount the true, true flow on where the return air comes in there. Sometimes it's it, it, it may not be physically possible to get the true flow into that location, but in most cases you are able to, um, there is enough room in that cabinet to, to get that true flow in place. And then, and then you'll have to uh, um, keep in mind that all of the airflow going into that cabinet needs to go through the true flow plate. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're setting that up. Um, you can, um, if you've got a two return system, use the two true flow plates you have and put one at each end um, and, and get those measurements at the same time. You can, you can um, disconnect the gauge after taking one measurement and go to the other one and, and then get that second measurement and, uh, and add those together for your total flow. If you've got, if you've got more than two returns or the re some of the returns are really small, then you're best um, going to the air handler unit and you know, you know if you've got a filter slot right at the air handler or putting the true flow inside of the air handler cabinet. Um, and then John asked if um, if you can if you can attach the the flex duct um, to the duct blaster fan when you're taking the measurement, and you certainly can, your flow through the, um, your, your total flow through the system will be less, um, but e you will still get an accurate reading, but your, the total airflow is reduced by adding that, the flex duct to it.
um, TEDS if, if um, one method is more accurate than the other and the accuracy of, of either the TrueFlow or using the, the Duck Blaster fan are very similar, um, but the TrueFlow will certainly save you setup time. It's much easier to, um, to just size that um, the true full plate for the size of your return grill and then take your measurement. Um, that, that process is pretty quick. So if time is a concern, then uh, the true full will certainly um, save you time. Um, you know, if you have three returns and they're all large returns and you have three true flow plates, you could, I mean, that's certainly uh, uh, another possibility for getting um, your airflow. If, if, it's, um, if it's difficult to get into the air handler cabinet, which oftentimes it is, and you have three large returns and you have three plates, you could certainly um, um, do it that way. Um, and then Todd was asking, um, once you get the results, how are you going to troubleshoot what the problems are? Um, probably if you're getting less airflow than you're supposed to, um, um, the, the static pressure measurements in the supply, um, supply plenum and in the return plenum tell you a lot about how restrictive those systems are. The, the higher the pressure, the more restrictive that, that system is. And um, sometimes adding additional supplies or reconfiguring the, the returns um, will go a long ways towards helping with that problem. Um, a lot of problems I've seen with, with duct work in a, in a crawl space is, is they go up through a wall cavity. So now instead of a, um, a 24 by 8, you're, you're necking that down to a 24 by 3 and a half because you're trying to put 8 inches of air through a, a 3 and a half inch stud space and, and that's where your reduc reduction is and you're, you may be seeing 100 pascals of pressure just on the return side and if you can widen that out, um, you, you should be able to get that pressure on the return side down to about 20 pascals or less. So. Um, a lot of times the airflow restriction is due to uh, to undersize um, is due to undersized ducts. Okay, let's see. We've got a few more questions coming in here. Um, looks like Joseph commented that Title 24 has changed and more systems may have um, more than two returns. Um, we're seeing just the opposite in Minneapolis <laughs> where we adopted the, we're adopting the 2012 code and, and we currently, um, almost all of our homes have a return in each room. And, and we'll be going down to more central return systems now that you can't use uh, building cavities for returns. Um, but if, if you have multiple return systems, then, then again, you'll have to um, deal with that using either multiple true flows or measuring right at the air handler cabinet. Um, Joseph mentioned that a, a pack unit is a panel that can be removed. Um, can the uh, true flow be placed inside? Certainly it could be uh, placed it right inside the air handler unit or if you can get it, um, um, if that panel gets you into the return side of the ductwork, you can put the true flow at an angle inside the ductwork. Um, that, that will work also. Um, 
Let's see. Um, um, Jamie asked a question about about um, how close can you install the true flow plate um, to the um, to an obstruction, and you can you can be within um, you can be within six inches. Um, upstream or two inches downstream. So an obstruction can be within six inches upstream or two inches downstream of the metering plate. So um, most of the time that's not a problem. Um, that that um, you you'll have you'll have two inches from from the blower fan, for example, um, where that filter slot is, and. Um, and if it's if it's less than two inches, then then you'll have to have to try that trick of putting the true flow plate at an angle um, in the ductwork. Um, but just make sure that all of the flow is, is going through the true flow plate. There are three returns coming into a plenum. Sometimes those those returns will will come um, right into the, they'll connect and come in from different sides of the air handler cabinet. So there, um, I think that's probably what what uh, Jim is referring to. You've got, for example, maybe you have an air handler unit in an attic and um, and the air handler unit is laying horizontally in there, and you've got, you've got one return coming off the the, the um, right side, and one coming off the back side, and one coming off the front side, or maybe underneath it. And um, then, really, the only the only practical way is to use three plates. In a case like that, you would need to use um, three true flow plates to get an accurate reading, because all the airflow needs to be going through the plates at the same time. So these are uh, these are great questions, um, but they're the real life things that you you run across. And when you do run across um, issues like this, um, you can give us a call for for tech support at at the Energy Conservatory because you you are going <laughs> to run across situations where um, where you haven't. Um, you haven't seen that kind of a situation, or, or you have questions about that, and it's uh, those of you who called our tech support, you'll see it's always easy to get through to us. Um, our phones are answered from eight until four Central Time, and um, and Pete, uh, Peter Burns, and and myself um, handle most of the tech support questions, but there are other people here, um, uh, Frank and Gary and Rob. That can help with uh, with tech support also in, in a pinch if if um, one of us are tied up or or we can get back to you uh, pretty quickly. But it's always best if you can give us a call right from the field, right from the house, and uh, and we can troubleshoot uh, help you troubleshoot the problem um, right from the house. And you know if you've got a, a duct blaster fan and a true flow. <laughs> Um, we should be able to figure out one way or another to get a, to get an airflow measurement. Um, in on a three JMS on a three trunk system, could you use the um, the filter slot? Um, and certainly, if you've got if you've got three filter slots, or, or I, I think what he's referring to is is there's a filter slot right at the air handler unit in this case. So you've got three returns, or maybe you have um, five returns or eight returns, um, but they all combine into uh, into a trunk, 
and and then there's a filter slot right at the air handler um, that's got the combined flow through all of those returns and in that case that's where you put the true flow is right in that filter slot and it would capture all the airflow from all of those returns. Um, and then uh, Joseph asked uh, if if you've got small returns um, can you build a box and, and then measure the airflow through there? Yeah, that would be the preferred method. You would, you would, um, if you're using the, for example, the, the 14 by 20 and, and that return is, um, is maybe an 8 by 12 or maybe a, um, 8 by 16, um, you'd, you'd want to make that transition from 8 by 16 to um, 14 by 20. So you'd use some cardboard and, and make a transition piece and, and tape that all up and, and get your airflow um, that way. So I think that that wraps it up. Um, I will I will be reviewing um, all of all of the questions that were submitted and um, if I didn't uh, specifically um, answer uh, your question, I will uh, um, send you an email response and I uh, will follow up and make sure that um, that we get all of your questions answered. And again, um, uh, give us a call for tech support if, um, if you run across something at a house that, where you're having a hard time um, getting a good accurate measurement. Um, so thanks again for, for attending our webinar and um, we do plan on, on doing them monthly for a while and um, if you go to our website and click on, on that YouTube connection and I believe that's in the upper right hand corner, um, just hit that YouTube icon and that will take you to all of our videos and all of our past webinars. Um, we do record them and, uh, and you can watch them um, at any time. Thank you.